So uh, yeah, again, thank you very much for the invitation and for organizing this, this seminar series. Uh, yeah, like I said, my, my laboratory has been interested by the, the cellular and molecular uh, mechanisms that control uh, the development of the cerebral cortex uh, over the past, I would say, 15 years. And, and today I'd like to put some emphasis on, on cell migration and try to show you how cell migration during cortical development shape uh, cortex morphogenesis. And uh, as you heard, the cortex, uh, and I'm going to, going to, to basically focus on, 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 on mouse here, uh, even though I'm showing a, a human brain. So like you heard, the cortex is a, is a laminar structure composed by a uh, layer. There are six layers of, of cells in the uh, neocortex or isocortex uh, that are mostly composed by uh, neurons, uh, the majority being the, the projection neurons that are born uh, locally. Uh, from a pool of progenitors, and there are uh, apical progenitors, intermediate progenitors that are producing the whole uh, bunch of, of projection rolls that will sit inside out to, to generate the, the different layers, but are also populated at, at the same time by uh, internal rolls that are generated ventrally in the forebrain and that have to migrate a long way through tangential uh, path uh, to integrate the structure. So you have uh, initially waves of neurogenesis, uh, which are followed by uh, gliogenesis, uh, during which you have uh, astrocytes, oligonal size that are generated. And I'll come back to this uh, a bit later on. So there's a whole uh, di big diversity of cell types that are generated during corticogenesis. And it's very important to, to understand the, the, the basic mechanisms of, of cortical development, uh, because most of the cortical malformation arise from initial defects in cell fate acquisition, cell proliferation, cell survival, cell migration. And you have examples here, uh, just few of them, uh, like lysencephaly, for instance, where you have a reduction in the folding occurring as a result of a def deficit of migration. Uh, so the lab is, is, is very interested to uh, cross talk with the clinic. And so the past 10 years, we've been interacting a lot with geneticists, for instance, that are uh, feeding us with uh, information uh, about patient courts uh, that are suffering from a specific type of cortical malformation. And uh, basically our job is to try to understand the function of the gene if it's unknown uh, and decipher the, how uh, the mutation impacts the function of the gene and the building of the cortex. And uh, on the other side, the lab is also, uh, and I'm a biologist, so we are very interested by basic science. And sometimes it happens that we discover new mechanisms of uh, important for cortical development that kind of make sense for, for, for the clinic. And I'm thinking here about, for instance, uh, our dec discovery about uh, the, the regulation of, of uh, direct versus indirect uh, neurogenesis in the cortex, being important to expand the number of neurons in the brain and being affected by uh, the Zika virus leading to microcephaly. But today I will mostly focus on, on migration uh, and I'll try to show you how cells shape uh, the cortex while they're migrating. So intuitively it's clear that uh, the migration is a process which is important to bring a cell from its birthplace uh, to its final destination in the cortex. But we and others believe that this migration while moving in the cortex can also convey its message uh, to the environment. And, enter into cross talks with different types of cells uh, to organize uh, the cito ar architectonic of the, of the brain and the cortex. And there are several examples that are published, such as uh, Galerich cells, uh, microglia, that is, for instance, interacting with uh, internal rolls. And today I will focus specifically on, on two types of cells that are actively migrating during corticogenesis. Uh, the cortical internal roll that we'll call SINs that are born ventrally, they are these purple cells that are uh, invading the cortex through streams, uh, tangential streams, and then the OPC for oligodendrocyte progenitor cells that are born in successive waves, some of them being born ventrally, and I will come back to this. And so today, what I want to do is to present for the first part, some published data about the cortical internal roles. Unfortunately, I will have no time to, to show follow-up uh, work on it. Uh, and uh, for the second part, I will focus specifically on those OPCs, which is uh, not yet published. So these cortical internal roles, uh, 
yeah, let me just introduce the model. This is a transgenic mouse line here. Uh, it's uh, a mouse expressing the GFP together with the Cree, by the way, and uh, a specific relatively sequence of genes uh, that are expressed by early post-mitotic uh, interneurons. And what you see here is a granular section through uh, the forebrain, and you see those streams of migrating cells. And if you do some timeless recording, that's what you have here, this inset, uh, you see how dynamic these cells are while migrating, and you can already appreciate that the migration is not constant, it's a saltatory motion, it's called saltatory migration. And this saltatory migration is actually made of repetition of migratory cycles, during which you have specific uh, events that remodel the morphology of the cells to allow it to move. Uh, so you have this uh, first, what I would call central kinesis. It's actually the formation of a bulge ahead of the uh, nucleus, uh, migrating within the leading process that you see here. Uh, it encompasses the centrosome and the Golgi apparatus, and this is followed by a quick translocation of the nucleus, uh, and this is called nucleokinesis. And during that time, there's also a dynamic branching of the leading process. And as you see, uh, this migration is made of repetition of pose and motion. And one of the questions that we had in the lab is, why are these cells posing during migration? Uh, what you can already see here is that the migration is not synchronized. So while some cells are posing, others are moving. Basically. Uh, one of the driver of this uh, migration and this nucleokinesis is actually uh, the polarization of uh, actomizing contraction behind the nucleus uh, to propel it forward within the leading process. And we've been working on this system uh, for the past 10 years, actually. Uh, so, in the lab, we are also interested by uh, specific post-translational modification. And uh, we noticed that one of them, polyglutamination, which is basically uh, the glutamination of, of proteins, was very uh, highly detected in those migrating interneurons. So this is actually, like I said, uh, a, trans uh, a modification where you have addition of, of glutamate, it was first discovered on, on Tublin dimers, but there's actually a whole bunch of protein that can be glutamylated or deglutamylated. So the glutamylation starts with the addition of a glutamate, uh, thanks to uh, those uh, tubulin tyrosine like ligases or TTLL. Uh, and then you have additional TTLL that will uh, extend the chain of glutamate. And on the other side, uh, you have enzymes that will digest the chain. Uh, they are called car carboxypeptidases. Uh, the CCP1 is one important for removing the, the chain glutamates, and for the branching point, you have CCP5. And to cut the long story short, we found that CCP1 was strongly enriched in those migrating interneurons. And you can appreciate here uh, the, the, the even distribution uh, within the cytoplasm of, of this protein. We can even detect some in the nucleus, and we, uh, we think that it can shuttle between the nucleus and, and the cytoplasm. So what we decided to do was to get rid of CCP1 specifically in those internals while they are migrating. And for this, we use a transgenic approach again. So this DLX56 Cree GFP that I presented before that we crossed with a locked uh, CCP1. And we then uh, 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 measured, sorry, uh, by time-lapse the migration of those cells. Uh, again, to cut the long story short, I'm just showing a representative experiment uh, where we are looking at the migration of a single uh, wild types uh, internal role. And uh, the, the fire color is about actomizing contraction. And so you see that it is polarized behind the nucleus and it's pushing the nucleus forward. You also see the jump here. Now, if you lose CCP1 expression from those cells, you see that the behavior is a little bit different. They're not jumping, they're gliding somehow. And uh, this is because, and you can see it, uh, the actomizing contraction is actually not polarized as it is in the control, it's more cup-like shape. And so the direction of the forces is different. And uh, this explains why uh, the nucleus is not uh, jumping, basically. And uh, now you would ask, why are you uh, facing such defect when you lose CCP1? Uh, Actomizing contraction depend on myosin 2 activity. Uh, and we noticed that MLCK, which is a kinase that activates myosin 2 by changing its conformation, uh, exists in two uh, different forms. There's a long form with uh, which age, which have, sorry, uh, glutamate chain 
uh, at the end, and a short form. And we noticed that the long form is more active than the short form. And CCP1 can actually digest this uh, thing. So if you lose CCP1, you change the ratio, and you basically uh, boost the actomyosin contraction uh, that are also not placed in the right position uh, within the cell. So that's how we explain the, the cellular defect. But I would say that the most striking observation uh, was made at the population level uh, when uh, we looked at the invasion of the cortex by those uh, cortical internals. So to, rem to remind you, this is a conditional knockout. So only the cortical internals are lacking CCP1 here. And so you see, as compared to the control, that in the conditional knockout, when CCP1 is not expressed, we have an advancement of uh, uh, the, the migration wave of, of internals. There are actually a lot of supernumerary internals uh, that are not expressing CCP1 as compared to the, the wild type. And this is true at all uh, rostrocoda level that, that we looked at. Uh, so I told you that, and you could see it, that the migration is actually not so much synchronized between cells. Uh, what we noticed by doing some experiments such as this one, uh, we basically uh, perform a, a pairwise uh, analysis. So you basically pick randomly two cells that are moving somewhere uh, in, in, in the slice, the brain slice. And more often they were mo moving together when they were not expressing CCP1. Uh, so we basically increase the synchronicity of movement at the population level. Uh, which means that you should have an advantage at the population level. It's very difficult to, to, to observe uh, in a slice, of course, because all cells start from a different point. So what we did uh, with the physicist was to, to do some modeling and ask him to do some uh, uh, surrogates, so basically virtual neurons that would incorporate uh, migration parameters from the control or the conditional knockout. And I wanted him to raise the uh, 150 uh, surrogates. And you are going to see a, a, a race uh, in a red. This is the conditional knockout. You see the bar, uh, which corresponds to 80% of cells that are moving ahead. And you see that there's an advantage at the population level. For sake of time, I cannot show it, but we basically showed this in uh, uh, microfluidic devices. So we could look back to biological experiment and show that it was actually uh, the case. So this is how we explain uh, this uh, precocious invasion of the cortex by those migrating cells, changing uh, the, 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 the sensory migration in a more gliding movement. What is interesting is that these supernumerary uh, internal walls were mostly found in one of the stream, uh, which is uh, running in the intermediate part of the cortex. Uh, the superficial stream was not so much affected, likely because the cells are actually uh, moving more on top of each other. Uh, at the superficies. Yes. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. And, uh, and, and so basically the supernary uh, internals are running in a region which is enriched into progenitors uh, that are generating uh, upper layer neurons and they are called intermediate progenitors. They can be seen as, as transient amplifying progenitors. And uh, we did some super resolution analysis, microscopy, sorry. Uh, so what we did was to uh, express a membrane cherry uh, in intermediate progenitors. And we looked at the contact between migrating internals in green here with those uh, intermediate progenitors. And we saw uh, in most cases, a uh, very close opposition between the, the two types of, of cells suggesting that they may talk to each other. And this is actually the case. When you look at uh, the rate of proliferation of those uh, intermediate progenitors, uh, you see that uh, it's increased in the CCP1 conditional knockout when the intermediate progenitors see more uh, of those internals. And there's a long-term impact on it, uh, which is an increased production of uh, upper layer neurons from those progenitors. When you look, for instance, at P21, and uh, since, and I haven't shown this, there's no differences in the overall generation of cortical internals, we believe that specifically in those layers, uh, in these upper layers, we might face some IE uh, balance deficits that we are now assessing by uh, electrophysiology uh, in the lab. Uh, so, so basically for, for this part, which is published, and I invite you to, to read the paper if you're interested in, uh, we have three take-home message. The first is a biochemical one. So we found a new way of control of MLCK activity through uh, a CCP1 dependent digestion of the 
uh, genome encoded glutamate chain of uh, MLCK. I told you the migration of those cortical interneurons is not synchronized at the population level. This is important following to be sorted properly from the ventral to the dorsal part. And CCP1 seems to be one of the key player for this. If you mess up with this process, like if you lose CCP1, you end up affecting a crosstalk which occurs within the cortex between those migrating interneurons and the intermediate progenitors. And this has long-term uh, consequence because you are ending up with more neurons in the upper layers. And so I have no time to show this, but we have also some uh, analysis of, of behavior suggesting that these mouse, uh, these mice, sorry, suffer from ASDA, ASD, sorry, uh, features. Uh, but uh, I'd like to spend the, the rest of the talk on, on the second part, which is actually unpublished, and I'm, I'm glad to have any feedback that you guys could, could provide. So it's about those OPCs that are also born ventrally, um, and uh, this is the work mostly uh, done by Carla and Fanny in the lab right now. Uh, so these guys, uh, if you look at the lineage, they express several types of markers, and I'm just showing this to, to point two specific markers that I will uh, cite again uh, in the following slides. So PGFR alpha is mostly enriched in immature uh, oligonal sites or OPCs, and SOX10 is expressed throughout the, throughout the lineage. Um, so what do we know about these OPCs in the forebrain? So back in 2006, uh, Nicoleta Kesaris published a paper uh, in Nature and Science uh, describing how OPCs uh, were generated into the cortex, I mean, in the forebrain, sorry. And uh, she uh, found that they were produced in three successive waves. Uh, the first being born uh, in the ventral forebrain from the preoptic area and the NGE at E12.5, followed by another one from the LGE, so still ventral, and the latest being born around birth from uh, dorsal progenitors this time. Uh, the, the third wave being the one mostly involved in the myelination of, of neurons in the cortex. And she, she noticed she couldn't find with the tools that we, we, we could have at that time, any traces of the ventral OPCs after birth. But recently uh, with the rising of, of the single cell biology and single cell sequencing, uh, one lab uh, in Stockholm, the, the lab of uh, Gonzalo uh, Castello Branco, uh, discovered that these OPCs, these ventral OPCs were still there, but they were basically outnumbered, diluted uh, in, in the postnatal ones. And uh, very recently, uh, two labs in Paris uh, described uh, that some of the ventral OPCs that are arising specifically from the POA uh, are entering into contact with uh, cortical internals that are also generated in the POA. And after birth and until around P15, they are making a GABAergic synapses. Later on, these OPCs will be involved in the myelination of uh, those uh, internals. So this is very interesting uh, to notice that these, these OPCs are actually born pretty much at the same place and are migrating pretty much at the same time with cortical interneurons. And so we wondered uh, whether these guys could somehow cross talk and maybe support each other uh, during migration. And uh, this is basically uh, the aim of, of, of this part of, uh, of the work. So first of all, what we did was to look at the distribution of uh, those OPCs and cortical interneurons in the forebrain during development. Uh, now I'm using calbinding uh, because at this stage, most interneurons express calbinding in red and PGF alpha is for the OPCs. So what you see is that there's uh, many more uh, interneurons produced and the OPCs are produced and they are located uh, close uh, to the uh, cortical internodes, and we can almost say that they are uh, uh, located in mutually exclusive uh, uh, region, right? And if you look uh, in the, the dorsal part of the forebrain, the, the future cortex, you see that the internals, like I mentioned before, are nicely organized into those uh, tangential streams. Uh, and you see that the, uh, the OPCs are, are, are more randomly distributed, a bit in a salt and paper manner, and they are also, uh, they are few, right? Uh, if you look later on at E16.5, uh, there's a little bit of background from the calbinding antibody on this slide, sorry about that. Uh, so this is where the telemocortical fibers are, are running. You see that the, the, the OPCs are, are sitting there. They just start to, 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 to migrate in, in the cortex, in the cortical plate. Uh, 
while the, the internals are already there and migrating active mode. So the distribution is quite uh, different. So what about the migration per se, the behavior? And so what we decided to do was to compare the migration mode of those uh, internals and OPCs that are migrating at the same time in the cortex. And for that, we use two transgenic house lines, the one that I described before for the internal roles and the Soxtan GFP for following those OPCs. Uh, you see that uh, there are less OPCs migrating, they're also larger and they have different parameters of migration. So these OPCs are migrating slowly uh, and they're also jumping a little bit, a little bit less. So maybe CCP1 is something to do here. Uh, uh, who knows, we, we are looking at that as well. Uh, but what is striking a bit later on, and I'm quite proud of this, this movie, where you can see three components of, of the cortex. So you see in white, uh, isolating beta uh, B4, sorry, positive vessels. Uh, in green, uh, you see the VOPs, so the, the OPCs, and the SINs, uh, the internal ones in red. And it's very striking. You see that the, uh, the, the, the VOPs are using the vessels to migrate and spread within the cortical plate while the cortical internals are, are basically blind to, to the, those blood vessels. And you know that there's a gradient of angiogenesis. And uh, basically, as the uh, angiogenesis proceeding time, you see that there are more and more VOPs associated with vessels. And at E16.5, uh, most of them are actually sitting on, on vessels. So they, are, they really like uh, moving on vessels. So the question that we asked then was, what if we just get rid of those VOPs? Uh, how will the cortical internals behave uh, in terms of migration? So for that, we use a transgenic strategy where we would basically uh, kill uh, the uh, VOPs by expressing the uh, diphtheria toxin. And you see that it's, it's, it's working. So after tamoxifen injection <coughs> uh, twice, uh, you look two days later, the, there's no more VOPs around. And very strikingly, we found a, a, a change in the migration for those internals. Uh, at, uh, again, all rostrocodal region that we looked at, uh, at 16.5, for instance, here, uh, we had a, a deficit in numbers of migrating internals. Uh, it's actually interesting uh, that there's actually no change in the overall number of cortical internals, uh, as uh, seen here by uh, faxing the whole pool of uh, cortical internals from the, from the forebrain. So it's, it's truly a deficit of migration, not of production or survival. And, and we have also a dispersion, eventual dispersion of the internal ones uh, when the, the VOPs are, are not around. You see that this dose and medial stream, uh, which is ventral actually, uh, which is limited here, difficult to see by PGFR alpha positive cells, is actually spreading laterally towards the ventricular zone. So it seems like uh, the VOPs uh, guide somehow the migration of those uh, internals. It is quite specific because there's, uh, as I told you, there's a whole bunch of cells that are migrating at the same time. So the VOPs, the internals, but you have also here in blue, uh, microglial cells <coughs> that are migrating. And if you look at the distribution of those microglial cells, when VOPs are not around, uh, there's no, no changes. So it's very specific for the cortical internals. And uh, another observation that we made, uh, we basically removed the uh, cortical internals with expression of, of diphtheria toxin, and we couldn't affect uh, the distribution of VOPs, uh, which suggests that there's a, a very specific relation between the VOPs and the internals, uh, and it seems like the VOPs are basically uh, somehow uh, having a, a, an active effect on the distribution of, of, of these internals. Uh, another thing that we observed when uh, the VOPs were not around is that the cortical internal walls were migrating closer and slower uh, uh, to, uh, towards the, the uh, vessel, sorry. And this is a movie showing a wild type situation when you have VOPs and cortical internal walls. We just see here the cortical internal walls in green and, and the vessels. And you can appreciate the migration of these cells. And then in a context where you are getting rid of these VOPs with the diphtheria toxin expression, uh, you see now that the internals are migrating slower and closer uh, to the blood vessels. And this is quantified here. So in blue uh, or, or in open circle, you see here the after first contact to blood vessels, uh, the internal ones would migrate away when VOPs are around, covering the vessels. 
if the valves are not covering the vessels, the internal walls will start to stick to the vessel somehow and also migrate slower. And this is depicted here. So we believe that the valves, by covering the vessels, prevent the internal walls to interact with the vessels through a kind of repulsion. And uh, why are these cells uh, going towards the blood vessels? Uh, cutting short again for sake of time, both express receptors for a chemokine, CXL12, uh, and the vessels are a strong source, local source of CXL12. We also notice that the VOPs express stronger uh, and, and more CX, CXL4, and so they, they seem to be attracted uh, primarily by, by these vessels. Uh, now, uh, if you uh, have no VOPs around, uh, 6R4 is also expressed by those internal walls, and they will start to migrate towards the blood vessels. Uh, how can we show this? So basically, uh, if you have a condition where you have no VOPs, the, the, the internal walls are, are sticking to the blood vessels, and uh, if you use an antibody against uh, the chemokine, 6L12, you basically prevent uh, these internal walls to interact uh, with the vessels, and these are the triangles. You can also unanchor the, 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 the OPCs by uh, using a, a wind blocker, uh, which uh, will basically prevent the expression or reduce the expression of 6R4 by uh, the, the pops. Um, so, and then this is one of the most interesting parts. Uh, so I, I told you that the, 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 the VOPs are covering the blood vessels, they prevent the internal to interact with the blood vessels, and they seems to uh, repulse the internal. So we decided to understand a bit better this behavior of repulsion. And for this, we went in vitro, co-culturing uh, internal in red from MG, uh, VOPs in green from, uh, from the POA. And we looked at the interaction of these cells. Uh, this is a movie showing in red an internal one contacting uh, here a, uh, a VOPs. And you see that uh, the internal ones will start to revert polarity uh, while being re uh, repulsed. So it's a, it's a unidirectional repulsion, which has never been described for any cell type uh, in any tissue so far. It's usually uh, a mutual repulsion that occurs. So we call this unidirectional contact repulsion, and this is the vast majority of the contact. So most internal touching uh, uh, VOPs is actually repulsed. It's like a, a tennis ball uh, rebounding on, on, on the racket, basically. Uh, the mechanisms, and I'm not going to much detail because we're still working on it. So we did some uh, gene ontology on, on available uh, databases from our paper, from, from the paper of, uh, of Gonzalo for the uh, of OPS. And we discovered that the most enriched uh, chemotaxis actors were actually uh, two families, f ephrine and uh, semaphrine plexin. Putting on side f ephrine, I'm not showing this data, we, we could basically using specific blockers, SRNA and so on, uh, put these guys on side. What we discovered is that through a CMA6B expressed by OPC and plexinatory expressed by the internal rods, uh, the U core was occurring. And so you have here the sequence. It starts with uh, the retraction after touching uh, this, this OPC. This is, these are neurodoids that, that we use for overexpression. Huh? Anyway. Uh, and, and so basically the first step is the retraction. This is followed by the regrowth of the, uh, the new leading process and then a migration of the centrosome. And this is uh, seen here, uh, touching, regrowing, and then you see the migration of, of the centrosome. Uh, we're still working on the downstream even of, of this uh, interaction. Uh, so uh, to sum up this part, basically what we discovered is, and, and we call them like that, is that the VOPs acting as herding dogs to guide the migration of those internal ones through UCOR. Uh, UCOR is very important to, to allow cells to be sorted properly, uh, to distribute ventrally properly, and to avoid sticking to blood vessels. Uh, if you mess up with UCOR, uh, you have the deficit of migration that I just mentioned. And, and to sum up uh, the, the, the presentation, basically, with this published part and unpublished part, uh, it's clear that migrating cells in the cortex or in the forebrain engage into the cross to, into cross to, to shape uh, the, the cortex. And I, I showed you the first crosstalk between the migrating internal and the IPs. It's actually uh, a true crosstalk because Vania Broccoli showed before, uh, like uh, five years ago, uh, that uh, the IPs, by releasing uh, 6L12, 
attract the cortical internals. Here we see that the cortical internals, by releasing something which is diffusible that we try, we, we try to identify, control the proliferation of those IPs and so the production of the upper layers. Uh, and not showing this, but we have seen that when you have uh, such defects or increased numbers of cells in the upper layers, you have behavior defects. And the other crosstalk is between those cortical internals and these VOPs uh, that are migrating together. Uh, we see that uh, they're engaging into UCOR, uh, and this is important to guide the migration of those internals properly uh, in the cortex. If you lose the VOPs, cells uh, are also expressing the machinery to interact with the vessels, and they start to seek to block vessels. And so with this, uh, I'd like to end and thank the people of the lab uh, that were uh, uh, mostly involved in, in those story. So for the VOP story, this is about uh, the work of, of two persons, Carla Silva, who is a senior postdoc in the lab, and Fanny Lepiem, who is a PhD, finishing the PhD, ah, helped yeah. with uh, Julie Stouffet and Miriam uh, Javier Torrent. And for the first part, is mostly the work from, again, Carla Silva uh, and Elise Per, who is a postdoc who left the lab a few years back. Uh, and these are our support, funding support, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.